Well, good morning. Uh, certainly a great to uh, be with all of you uh, once again here uh, this morning. And uh, uh, what Mr. Hall was talking about was um, I just uh, recently finally passed my oral defense for my doctorate degree. So I'll be uh, hopefully receiving that next month. So uh, uh, again, I thank y'all for your prayers for that. And uh, also thank you again for your prayers uh, for my my uh, my family and also uh, my uncle. Uh, his memorial service went well yesterday, and and uh, I think it was not only honoring to him but also honoring to God as well. So again, thank y'all for your prayers and and cards and everything. We certainly greatly appreciate it. Uh, well, today we're going to be continuing in uh, Jeremiah chapter one. So if you do have your Bibles with you, uh, please feel free to turn to Jeremiah chapter one. And uh, last week we talked about just how God uses our background to prepare us for the call that he has on our lives. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the rest of Jeremiah chapter 1, where we see the mission that God has for Jeremiah. And what we're going to see here is three steps that we can take in order to not only know what our mission is, but also how we can accomplish that mission as well. Before we get into that, about two or three years ago, my wife and I, we were eating at uh, an Applebee's in South, South Virginia. I was still serving my last church there at, at that point. And we had a nice waitress that day, and, and you know, she took our order, and uh, we waited you know, for, for the food to come out. And I felt the Holy Spirit tugging on my heart to ask the waitress when she came back with our food to ask if, if she needed prayer. Now, I'll be honest with you, you would think as a pastor when the Holy Spirit gives you a prompting like that, that you just jump right on to it. Well, I'll be honest with you, at least for me anyway, I was struggling with that because there were other times where the Holy Spirit led me to do that, but I unfortunately didn't obey that that prompting but on this particular instance i did and when she came back with our food she asked obviously you know is there anything else that i can do for you before before you eat and i told her well actually my wife and i we we actually pray before well we usually pray before we eat uh is there anything that we can pray for you anything going on in your life that that you'd like for us to, to pray over and at first, she couldn't think of anything. And, uh, you know, she said, well, I can't think of anything, but I do appreciate you asking. And then, you know, she headed back to the kitchen. But while she was on her way back, then something popped in her mind. And she came back to us. And she said, you know, I just did think of something. And I said, well, okay, well, what, what is it? And she said, I actually have an uncle who just had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I was wondering if you could, you know, keep him in your prayers. And I told her, I said, we certainly would. And, uh, you know, we weren't going to pray with her right there at, at the table. Uh, but, of course, she had to go back into the kitchen because, you know, she was, they were having a busy lunch at that time. But Caitlin and I prayed for her uncle and, and then uh, prayed over the, the food. And then we ate. And then I left her my business card and. And also a, a note saying if there's anything else we can do for you, just let us know. But like I mentioned earlier, there have been many other times where God had prompted me to do something similar, and I didn't go through with it. And to be honest, when we do receive promptings like that, it's very easy to make excuses, isn't it? Sometimes we go, well, I just don't have time to do it, or or for some of us that are reserved, have a reserved personality, I'm a little too shy of doing that. Or we might think, well, if I if I do something like this, they, they may think there's something wrong with me or something. I mean, we can just come up with excuse after excuse after excuse when God asks us to do something. But again, as we'll see here in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 19, we can take certain steps that will enable us to complete the mission God desires us to do. And I'm hoping that through this message that when we think about that we'll look at it from a different perspective.
perspective than what we usually do. Because usually when we look at the mission that God has for us, we think about our own weaknesses and inadequacies. But what I'm hoping through this message is that we realize that in order to accomplish God's mission, we can't rely on ourselves. We actually have to rely on God. And there's a reason why. I'll get into that here in just a moment. But first, I'm going to ask so I'm going to be talking about three steps that we can take in order for us to be able to complete the mission that God has for us to do. Now that mission may be one type of mission for one person. For another person, it could be another type of mission. So this is any mission that God wants you to do. So here's number one. Number one is do not underestimate your potential. Do not underestimate your potential. Now, here's what verses 4 through 8 of Jeremiah chapter 1 says. The word of the Lord says this. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God. Behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So we see in this group of verses that God begins to talk to Jeremiah. And we see here that God lets Jeremiah know what he wanted him to do. But here's the interesting thing that we see. Before Jeremiah was even conceived, God had already planned out what Jeremiah was supposed to do for him. God had wanted him to be a prophet to the nations. And again, he did this before Jeremiah was even born. But guess what? God does the same thing for each and every one of us as well. Before any of us here were even born, God knew what he wanted you to do in your life for him. And we can always trust God in that because, again, God knows a whole lot more things than we do. And he sees the future a lot more farther than we do. And, again, he knows what he wants us to do even before we are born. But look at the response Jeremiah gives. He says, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. Now, we may look at that, and we may go, Why would Jeremiah say something like that? He should have just jumped on the opportunity. But let, let's not jump on him too much. Just let, let's be honest. When God does give us something, should we have a little bit of nervousness or, or a little bit of fear in what he would want us to do? I think that would be a healthy thing because, you know, we should take seriously on what God wants us to do. And probably that's what Jeremiah was doing here. He wanted to make sure that he was ready for this. However, the Lord wouldn't take that excuse. You see, the excuse Jeremiah gave was, well, I don't really know how to speak because I'm only a youth. Now, the Hebrew word for youth could mean pretty much any age, to be honest with you. It could mean a baby, it could mean a toddler, it could be a, a child, a teenager, or even a young man. Now, most likely, Jeremiah at this time was probably a teenager at this point, and probably close to, probably around 20 years of age. And he probably didn't have any experience at that point on speaking in front of others or being a prophet. But God tells Jeremiah not to get that excuse. Instead, God gives him three commands. And notice in these commands, there's a certain letter that you see here repeated. And that letter is, of course, I. And, of course, I is describing the Lord. It says, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you. So here's what God is commanding him to do. God is saying, whoever I send to you, that's where you go. Whatever I command you, or whatever I tell you to say, 
That's what you should say to the nation of Judah. Do not be afraid of those that you speak to, because I will be there to deliver you. So the first thing I want you to understand is this. Here's the reason why we should not underestimate our potential. Because when we look at the word success, it comes from God's provision, not our talent. Now, of course, God gives us the talents that we have. And yes, we do need to use them in order to get better at them. But it's only through his strength and his wisdom that we can use those talents effectively. See, God not only knows what he wants you to do in your life, but you see, God also gives you the tools that you need in order to accomplish that mission. So that's why we should not underestimate our potential, because God not only knows what he wants us to do, but he also gives us the tools that we need in order to accomplish that mission. So we should not worry about our own inadequacies, because again, God will give us the tools that we need in order to overcome those weaknesses. As Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33 say, and I'm sure you've probably heard of this passage as soon as I read it, and it talks about being anxious and being worried that we don't have certain things. Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, of course, Jesus was talking about some physical things that we need, but you know, it also describes the things that we need in order to accomplish the mission that he's given us as well. We need to be able to depend on God, and to ask him not only to provide what we need, but to believe that he will provide what we need in order to accomplish that mission. So as long as we rely on his strength and on his wisdom, we cannot underestimate our potential for him. So number one, do not underestimate your potential. Two, we need to listen to God meticulously. We need to listen to God meticulously. Let's look at verses 9 through 10. It says, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So we see here in verse 9 kind of the illustration of the first point, right? We see that God provided what Jeremiah needed in order to accomplish the mission that he had for him. The Lord actually put out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth. Now, if you're familiar with the scriptures, we know that God did that to another person, right? It was another prophet. His name was Isaiah. He, touched, he actually touched his mouth with a burning coal. But here's the difference. You see, Isaiah was being cleansed for his calling. But what we see here with Jeremiah is that Jeremiah was actually being empowered by his calling because Jeremiah knew that he was inadequate in order to accomplish that mission. And so after God gives him what he needs, he gives him four negative commands and two positive ones. And these four negative commands and two positive commands basically describe the mission that God has for Jeremiah to the nation of Judah. So here are the first two commands. To pluck up and to break down. To pluck up and to break down. So here's what Jeremiah was first asked to do. You see, Judah has strayed away so far from the Lord that the only way that they could be saved was their society basically needed to needed to have a major overhaul, basically. They, they needed to get rid of a whole lot of things in order to be right again. Judah needed to be completely uprooted 
and torn and tear down its established lifestyle if there was going to be any hope for the future. So part of Jeremiah's mission that God asked him to do was basically the stage of intervention. I know that some of you may have heard of how an intervention goes, especially for those that might be struggling with, with drugs or alcohol and their family would come together and stage an intervention. Well, basically that's what Jeremiah needed to do with the nation of Judah. He needed to stage an intervention and help Judah come to understand this process. In other words, Jeremiah needed to help Judah understand that they were sinners. That they had strayed so far away from the covenant of God that they needed a major overhaul in their society in order to have any hope whatsoever. And then God asked him to destroy and to overthrow. To destroy and to overthrow. Now, of course, Jeremiah would not be doing this himself. Again, Jeremiah is asked to deliver a message. He's not there to do any wars or anything like that. But he is to tell the nation of Judah when it comes to destroying and overthrowing. This reflects the type of purging that God would use in order to restore his people. And that was this, a foreign invasion and war. So in other words, a foreign nation was going to come in and was going to destroy the nation of Judah. And of course, we see later on in Jeremiah that nation was actually identified as the Babylonians. The people of Judah that have repeatedly broken their covenant with God and they have refused to turn back to him. And part of the covenant was that they did turn away from the Lord and would not return back to him. That God would remove them from their land. That he had given them. And he was going to use the Babylonians. To do just that. So they needed to be removed. From their complacency. As punishment for their unfaithfulness. So so far. What you've heard. How many of us would actually sign up for that job? Probably not many of us. <laughs> but this is what. God had asked Jeremiah to do. But I'm sure when Jeremiah was hearing all this. He was probably sitting there wondering. I'm not for sure if I want to sign up for this job. He probably had some reluctancy. But then we get to the two positive commands, which says this, to build and to plant. There was going to be a time where the nation of Judah would be out of their land. But God, behind the scenes, would work to restore them back to their land later, which he ultimately did. God will be working to restore his people. And that's the way it goes even with our own personal sin as well. God has to purge sin out of our lives. He needs us to realize that we are sinners. But he also gives us the hope that we can be restored back to where we were. And eventually, there will come a time when we won't have to worry about sin anymore. But what I want you to see here in the second step is that God specifically outlined that the specifics of Jeremiah's mission. So basically he had to tell the nation of Judah what they were doing wrong. He needed to tell the nation of Judah what God was going to do about it. And then he needed to tell the nation of Judah what God was going to do after the punishment. So how does that apply to us? Well, we need to also listen to the specifics that God gives us in our mission. And the only way that we can do that is we need to take the time to be in his word and also to listen to what God has to say for us. But we also need to take note of God's promises as well and listen to them carefully. Because even when we have to do a very hard thing, God promises that he will restore us back to where we need to, where we need to be. Whatever God says that he will do, I promise you, he will fulfill it. Because as the, as the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 55, verses 10 through 11, he says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, it sh but it shall re accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which 
I sent it. And then verse 11, I kind of like the King James Version better on that, where he says that it shall not return to me void. I think that kind of describes it a little bit better, even though empty is not bad either. But it shall not return to me void basically means that whatever God says is going to accomplish, it's going to go out there and accomplish it. It's never going to come back, return to sender, as we see in the mail sometimes. When God sends it out, it's going to go out and accomplish its mission. So we see, first of all, that we should not underestimate our potential, that we need to listen to God meticulously, and then finally the last step is that we need to trust God fully. We need to trust God fully. And so we see that God gives two visions Jeremiah to confirm the mission that he has given him. The first vision that we see here in verses uh, 11 through 12 is the vision of the almond branch. So we see it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Now, if we were just to read that in the English, we would actually miss something. Because if we were to read this in the Hebrew language, there's actually a play on words here. And in order to know that, you kind of need to know the background of why God used the almond branch. You see, in Israel, the almond branch, when springtime comes, was actually called the awake plant. And here's the reason why. When springtime came, the almond tree would be the very first tree to bloom. And basically the message it would send is this, is that the fruit is coming. And so here's what God was trying to communicate to Jeremiah through this vision. God was saying that, number one, he had not forgotten his covenant with Judah. And also the blessings and the judgments that come along with it. In other words... God was saying this. It's that I've not forgotten my covenant. The blessings that come along with it will come. But also the judgments that come with it will also come. So when God gives his word, it will be accomplished. It may not be in our own timetable, but it will be in his timetable. And then we see in verses 13 through 16 the second vision. Or, or excuse me, verses 13 and 14 of the boiling pot. And so it says again, the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And then we see God's explanation of what that vision is in, in verses uh, 14 through 16. It says, then the Lord said to me, out of the north disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they shall come. And every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls all around, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. So Jeremiah sees the second vision of a boiling pot, and this boiling pot is being tipped over. So when Jeremiah looks at it, it looks like it's coming from the north, the way the, the, the boiling liquid was coming out of this pot. And God says, this represents the foreign invaders that will be coming from the north to destroy the nation of Judah. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it was later identified as the Babylonians. But if you were to look at a map during that time, let's just say right here is the nation of Judah. Babylon was actually situated right here to the east. But here is how they fulfilled that prophecy. If Babylon would came directly from the east, they would not only have to cross over the Euphrates River, but they would also have to go across the desert. 
That would have been deadly to them if they would have tried that. So here's how they would accomplish it. Instead, they would follow the Euphrates River all the way to its beginning, and then they would come down and destroy the nation of Judah. And that's what they ended up doing. They ended up following the Euphrates River all the way to its beginning, and then they came down from the north to attack the nation of Judah. And as, as God says here, that they will penetrate the gates of Jerusalem, which they did, and they will capture not only Jerusalem, but also all the other cities of Judah and destroy them. You see, even the walls were going to be torn down as we actually see they were torn down as well. And it will not protect Jerusalem from its invaders. But then God gives the explanation of why these invasions were to happen. As we see there in verses 15 and 16. It's because Judah had violated the covenant that they had with the Lord. In fact, they broke the first two of the Ten Commandments. Which is, they shall not have any gods before them. And also they made images of other gods. So they broke both of those commandments. And because of that, now judgment was going to be called upon them. And then we see in verses 17 through 19 that this chapter is concluded by God giving Jeremiah a challenge and a warning. And it says, starting in, in verse 17, But you dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them, Everything that I command you, do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And, be, and I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. So God challenges Jeremiah to arise and go to work. Telling the nation of Judah everything that he tells them to tell them. And God also tells him that he will provide the protection and tools for him that he needs to accomplish his mission. Because as he says, he will make him like a fortified city with iron pillars and bronze walls that cannot be penetrated. And by the way, the materials they used back there in that time to protect themselves were wood columns and stone walls. So obviously these materials of uh, iron pillars and bronze walls is a lot stronger. Because with wood columns, guess what? You can burn those. And with stone walls, guess what? You can use a battering ram to destroy those walls. But with iron pillars and bronze walls, you can't use any of those weapons against those. Now that's not to say that God wasn't going to allow certain things to happen to Jeremiah, because as we see throughout the book, there were certain things that did happen to him. But what God is saying is that he wasn't going to allow them to kill him. But then God concludes with a warning. He tells him up front, he says, every person that you talk to, they're not going to listen to you. The kings of Judah is not going to listen to you. His officials aren't going to listen to you. His priests are not going to listen to you. The people of the land, it's not going to listen to you. The land itself will not listen to you. They're going to be all against you when you deliver this message. But again, God promises they are not going to prevail against Jeremiah because God is going to be with him and will deliver him. But God does tell Jeremiah this too. He says, don't be afraid of these men when you deliver this message. Because if you become discouraged and refuse to deliver the message, then God was going to give Jeremiah reasons to be discouraged in front of Judah, which would not have ended well. And there will be times Jeremiah was going to be discouraged. I mean, when you tell someone, you know, they need to repent, they just continually refuse, I mean, anybody could be discouraged with that. And Jeremiah was. But God continued to be with him and allowed him to accomplish his mission. 
And what I want you to know is that God will be with you to accomplish your mission as well. There are going to be times of opposition. And there may be times you may feel like that you won't succeed. But what we have to remember is that God's definition of success is different from our definition of success. For many of us, we look at numbers to define success. Let's just take the example of evangelism, for example. We would probably say probably one of the most successful evangelists ever in, probably in our lifetime is probably Billy Graham. And obviously he was, because he touched millions of people. But we may also look at someone that may be faithfully preaching the gospel, but may only lead one or two people to Christ. In many people's eyes, they would be considered a failure compared to Billy Graham. But you see, that's not how God looks at it. God looks at it like this. He doesn't look at numbers. He looks at our faithfulness. When we are faithful to the mission he gives us, God will tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's why we always need to follow Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So we see the three steps. We cannot underestimate our potential to serve God because God knows what he wants us to do and he provides us the tools to do it. Number two, we should listen exactly to what God wants us to do so that we can obey him. And then number three, we should also trust God fully because he will be there with us through the adversity and give us the strength and wisdom to accomplish the mission. So I want to leave you with these two questions. And I encourage you this week to meditate and think about these questions during the week and talk to God about it. First of all, if you don't know this already, what does God want you to do today? What is the mission that he has for your life? And then number two, what has been your excuse that you've given him for not doing it? What has been your excuse for not doing it? And I encourage you, when you go to God with these two questions, if you don't know what God wants you to do, I encourage you to ask God and find out what he wants you to do. And if you do know what he wants you to do, but you may have been giving him excuses, I don't know what those excuses may be, if that's between you and God. But if he's given you excuses, I mean, if you've given him excuses, then I encourage you to cast those excuses away and just realize that as long as you're living and breathing here on this earth, God has a purpose for you. And he'll give you the tools that you need in order to accomplish that mission. So may we never make the excuse of telling God that we can't do certain things. Because he gives us the wisdom and the strength and the tools that we need to accomplish the mission. So I'm asking you to join me in a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that we would meditate on these two questions of what would you have us to do today if we don't already know what that mission is and I just pray also Lord that if we do know what you've called us to do but we've given excuses I pray Lord that we would evaluate what those excuses were and I just pray, Lord, that we would cast those excuses aside. And I just pray that we would leave those excuses at the cross. And that we would realize that you not only give us the strength and the wisdom in order to accomplish the mission, but you also give us the tools that we need in order to accomplish the mission that you have for us. And Heavenly Father, there might be someone here this morning in the sanctuary or those that may be listening.
posting on Facebook that have never made a decision on the very first call that you have given us. And that is to trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I just pray, Lord, that if there is someone here or someone on Facebook, Lord, that has never made that decision, I pray that they would make that decision here today and not delay it any longer. And I pray this.